All are still standing. Let us bow our heads together in prayer. Father, it is before your throne of grace that we come this evening, gathered in your name, Father, to thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus, who died for us on the cross. We thank you, Father, that we've once again, after a busy week, have the privilege and the honour of being together amongst other believers, Lord, gathered together, Lord, in one spirit to uh, sing praises to you, to pray to you, Lord, and to study your word. And Father, we pray this evening that your Holy Spirit, Father, helps us to understand and focus on what you have for us, Lord. Let the worries of the week, the cares of the world, Lord, be cast aside for these short moments, Lord. And let us just enjoy the fellowship that we have and your fellowship amongst us, Father. We pray, Lord, that you bless and are with our brothers who are in Sydney for the elders' meeting, Lord. We pray that you uh, give them the wisdom uh, to uh, make the decisions and the conversations that they need to have, Lord. Father, we pray for those who couldn't join us this evening, who may be joining us online remotely. That you give them an extra portion of, their ble of, of blessings, Lord, as well. And also maybe those who may listen to this sermon later on, Father, we pray for them as well, that they receive it through the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray and ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. So this evening I'd like you to open up your Bibles with me to the Gospel of John, a very well-known passage, uh, the Gospel of John chapter 12. Uh, it's um, a critical point in the story that we read about the last few weeks of Jesus Christ and it describes amongst other things the anointing at Bethany of Jesus and I'm going to read verses 1 to 26 yeah verses 1 to 26 so we'll read half the chapter so John chapter 12 and I'll begin at verse 1 then six days before the Passover Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was who had been dead whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had a money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Now, a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord the king of Israel. And Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things that were written about him. Sorry, they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason the people also met him because they heard that he had done the sign. The Pharisees therefore said amongst themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now there were certain Greeks among those who had come up to worship at the feast and they came to Philip who was from Bethsaida of Galilee and asked him saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered to them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. 
But if he dies, he produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honour. Till there. This is, a, this is a passage which jumps from one theme to the other. There's a lot happening here. And it is um, uh, a week before the death of Jesus Christ. And John Dryden, is one of the greatest poets of the 17th century, wrote, Death in itself is nothing. But what I fear most is not to know if I die, but to know when I die. So John said, John Dryden, this poet, said, I don't fear death itself, I know it's bound to happen. But what I do fear is knowing when. So imagine you knew when you were going to die. If you knew you only had one week to live, how would you live it? How different would it be from last week? And I suppose if you ask that question, there would be many varied answers. Uh, Some people would say, you know what, I would spend as much money as possible on my credit card and leave the debt to someone else. I'm dying in a week. An astute businessman might say that he would buy massive amounts of life insurance um, and and ensure that his family that was being left behind would not be left wanting. Maybe, you know, quit my job instantly and spend that last week with my family. Maybe I'd spend it with my children, talk about the important things in life, maybe write them each one of them a letter. You know, maybe a practical person may organise and prepay their funeral. I remember my mother-in-law, on her last day before she died, she called in a brother from church and arranged the menu for her wake. That's how practical my mother-in-law was was very concerned that people would have have enough to eat, a typical Greek mum. Maybe someone would actually think about their eternal life and confess their sins to God and witness to their family and friends. What would you do if you knew you would die in a week? One thing is for sure, your perspective would change, wouldn't it? From one instant to the next. And it's not, it's not an idle question. One week, one day, one minute will be my or your last. And when life, when life is stripped down to its bare minimum, what you plan to do for those last moments of your life declare by definition what your priorities are in life. And this question, in fact, is a question that Jesus himself had to face and answer. And Jesus knew that this was his last week on this earth prior to being put to death on the cross. And therefore, by definition, Jesus spent his last week doing things that he knew were of paramount importance. It is important to note that almost half of the gospel account of all four gospels, almost half of it, describes how Jesus spent his last week on earth. It is amazing to note that over the three years of Jesus' ministry on earth, the gospels spend about 50% describing the last week. There is a definite transition from the public ministry to the private ministry in John chapter 12, from which we've just picked up. From that point onwards through to chapter 19, Jesus spends his time with his own select friends, no longer out ministering to the masses. And we can deduct from this that when Jesus spent his last week here on earth, knowing that it was his last week, He saw the time that he would spend with his disciples as of the greatest importance. In fact, 
John describes from verse 12 onwards no further miracles until the resurrection. Now, one of the friends he chose to spend time with is Lazarus in Bethany. The man he had once raised from the dead. And I'd like to think about the conversation if I was an observer around this table. Now, here is a man who had spent four days in the grave. He's sitting with Jesus. He's sharing a meal as if to reinforce the miracle that Jesus had performed and bestowed on him. It reminds me of, of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 to 6, as I was thinking about this, where we, Paul writes, And while we were dead in our transgressions, like Lazarus was dead, he made us alive with Christ and seated us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places. And similarly, he raises Lazarus from the dead and sits next to him and shares a meal with him, as if to punctuate and reinforce this blessed miracle that he had performed for those who were around. And we read in the other verses afterwards, as we just shared earlier, that the fact that Lazarus was alive, that story was spreading like wildfire and causing others to believe as well. And our text then talks about a, ma a woman named Mary. And we are told that she gave a gift to Jesus that some people thought was overboard, excessive. People thought in that group that what Mary did for Jesus was over the top, simply too much. In other words, many thought Mary's gift to Jesus was extravagant. Now, I would, I would be the first to agree that many things in our society are extravagant. When I hear of someone spending $2 million on a wedding, and in these days, who knows if it will last, I think that is extravagant and over the top. Simply too much. When I hear of someone spending, I don't know, $15,000 for a night in a six-star hotel room, I think that's extravagant. I think spending, you know, $450,000 on a car is extravagant. And I could go on and on telling you what I think is extravagant. I'm sure you have your limits of what you think is extravagant. And everybody probably looks at some of the things that are happening around us and think, what a waste. Now, often the word extravagant has negative connotations. It is used in a bad way, and when you see people take the blessings that they have been given by the Lord and squander, that, um, squander those blessings on themselves with no second thought, you know, it is a bad thing. However, when a person expresses, expresses their love and worship for Jesus Christ in a manner that could be described as extravagant, there is nothing negative about it. After all, he's worthy of everything we can render to him because all we have comes from him anyway no gift is excessive no expression of love over the top no form of worship should ever be considered too extravagant to give to jesus and so mary mary takes this vial of or box of ointment and breaks it open now in those days it's not like today where we come to church and pass by people and everyone's wearing nice aftershave or the ladies nice perfume or cologne or the guys and you smell perfume and you're used to smelling that you know in today's society there's a lot of that around you know in those days a perfume and an ointment such as this would have been a rarity you know, poor people would never have smelt this and it says that as this was broken in verse 3, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. I can just imagine 
the house filling with his fragrance. There would have been people, probably ladies, in the kitchen or in another room preparing the meal for Lazarus and Jesus and the disciples. And as they're busy preparing, they would have, what's that, what's that smell? What's that beautiful smell? Maybe people who were sitting outside near the windows trying to listen in would have suddenly smelt this beautiful aroma. And what was this? It was an act of worship. Mary didn't care who saw her. She didn't care what they thought. She was oblivious to her surroundings. Matthew Henry comments on this part of Scripture and writes, Mary was lost. She was lost in worship, oblivious to what was happening around her. Have you ever lost yourself in worship? What am I talking about? I'm not talking about some trance or being in church and repeating the same chorus, you know, 70, 100, 50 times, whatever, you know, and trying to get into some sort of trance state. I'm not talking about that. Have you ever been just away on holidays, on your own, with your family, maybe walking along a beach or sitting along somewhere in a forest or even in a busy cafe in another town or another city and reflecting on the blessings that God's given you, on actually spending that time contemplating the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, thinking about your relationship with him, singing a quiet hymn to yourself, Maybe pulling out a Bible and sitting on that cafe, dare I say, you know, in some boulevard in Paris, I don't know, or in some place in Greece, pulling out your Bible and just spending some quiet time with God, losing yourself in worship on your own, just you and your Saviour. Or are we so caught up in the business of today that we don't even spend a few spare moments with Him? So Mary... She broke a flask of ointment and poured it and poured it on the feet of Jesus um, and wiped his feet with her hair. This ointment was valued by Judas at 300 denarii. Now, denarii, as I did a bit of research, a denarii was a daily wage of the average worker. So, a bit of mathematics. Say a denarii is $150, that's probably the lower end of a wage for today, but let's say $150. Therefore, in modern terms, $150 times 300, 300 denarii, is worth $45,000. This was a gift of immense value. Spikenard is a plant that only grows at the feet, foot of the Himalayas on the mountains on the Indian side of the border. So it's between India and Nepal. It grows at the base of the Himalayas. And you could imagine how difficult it would have been in that time and that era to access that spike nut. That's how valuable this was. And in fact, in fact, I want to do a bit of research about this. This sort of ointment was in fact passed from generation to generation as an heirloom. And a lot of the times this ointment lasted for over 150 years within the families. Mary's fragrant oil of spikenard was a rare imported product difficult to get in Israel. The majority of people in that room would have never even smelt it, let alone seen it. It would have been Mary's most valuable possession. Spikenard is rich rose red in colour, hard to acquire. And people were forced to save for many, many years just to provide enough ointment for their own funeral. In fact, as I said it was so valuable that it was passed along generation to generation as an heirloom or as an investment. And in the breaking of this flask, none of this is incentive, this is already prophetic. 
two ancient Eastern traditions come into view. The first is, and it has to do with the breaking of glasses. So when a distinguished person ate in a home, often the glass that they used to drink from or the container or the vessel that they used to drink from was broken as a matter of honour to prevent a lesser person from using it and drinking from it in the future. And this may have been in Mary's mind as she broke the box or the, or the vial, or it may have not been. But the spirit was working through her, and it was very prophetic. And another custom had to do with burial rituals. After the body of the deceased had been washed and anointed, the box that contained the embalming spices and perfumes that was used to, to anoint the dead body was broken and the, frag the fragments of that vessel were buried with the individual's body that was used to anoint. Perhaps this was in Mary's mind. Or perhaps not. But unwittingly, her act was a prophetic one in anticipation of Christ's imminent death. However, I would like to imagine from her perspective that she broke that vessel so that she might extract every drop of ointment for use on her beloved Lord Jesus. Regardless of the reason and her thoughts, one thing is clear. Mary gave everything that she possessed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I wondered, for myself first and for us, have we broken that alabaster flask of our life and poured out ourselves, every drop of ourselves for him, at whatever the cost? This is the thought that occupied the mind of Paul as he faced his own death, as we read in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand, Paul wrote. Now we move to verses 4 and 5 of our story. Now all of a sudden, this wonderful scene of worship, this intimate moment is shattered by Judas, who questions her motives and challenges Jesus for accepting this offering. It is so obvious that G Judas has completely missed what is happening here. On the surface, Judas's response seems logical. John, however, writes this gospel about 60 AD with a lot of hindsight. Around 30 years, in fact, of hindsight. And he tells us that Judas essentially was a thief. He was not concerned about the poor. He was concerned about lining his own pockets. He most probably sees here a lost investment or thieving opportunity for himself. Remember, he betrayed Jesus for just 30 pieces of silver, around $9,000. Here is a $45,000 piece of kit that's gone out of his hand. This perfume, this perfume was worth so much more. And Jesus in verse 7 stops him short in his tracks. Jesus doesn't need the benefit of hindsight, he sees it straight into Judas's heart and tells him, leave her alone. I like to think it as a nice biblical way of saying, shut up, Judas. Christ is saying to Judas, mate, you are missing the big picture here. This is not about money. This is not about feeding the poor. There is a time... And there is a place for that, he says. This is about the Messiah, the plan of salvation, all of history arriving at this singular point. The whole universe is focusing on this hour, not only the whole universe, but all of heaven. 
We need to be careful to ensure that our own prejudices and misconceptions don't come in the way of God's plan. When you become judgmental and you think things are not going the way you think they should be going, search into your heart and to your motives. Let us not let our own misconceptions and prejudices come in the way of God's plans. Now in verse 9, John moves to focus on another important event, as if time is running out as he's writing this. He jumps from one to another. So Lazarus, as I said before, well, Lazarus, he's a bit of a freak show by now. In verse 10, we read that the chief priests, in fact, sought to kill him because they're fed up. This Lazarus was living proof of the power of Jesus Christ. And because of this, the people were believing in Jesus Christ. And and all all these chief priests were losing the grip of power over the population. Talk about, again, like we said about Lazarus, talk about missing the big picture. Talk about their preconceptions, their own fears, their own biases coming into play and the chief priests failing to see just this amazing miracle of Lazarus for what it was and the power of Jesus Christ who performed this. They fail to see this miracle because the judgment is clouded by their own desires and it is their desire to cling to power. And in verse 12 we see the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, what we typically celebrate on Palm Sunday. The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Fulfilling the prophecy of over 600 years from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, where he calls and prophesizes that the people would sing Hosanna as the Messiah rode on the baby of a donkey or the coal of a donkey. Think of the contrast. The one which the chief priests, this Messiah, to save them from the Roman Empire, the one which the chief priests said would come from the sky in a fiery chariot to save his people, enters Jerusalem on a donkey, born in a manger, considered illegitimate by many. What a strange strange set of paradoxes and God is a God of paradoxes David the shepherd the one who was not even considered worthy by his father chosen over his brothers Moses a stutterer and a murderer chosen to lead God's people out of bondage Paul a persecutor of Christians and a fanatical zealot bent on destroying the church, called on to become the greatest apostle known. And again, John quickly moves on. Verse 20. Now I find Andrew an intriguing character. Verse 20. The the Greeks firstly went to... So there were Greeks who were gathered there to celebrate the feast of Passover and all the things they had to do. A lot of people in town. So the Greeks went to Philip first. And I thought, why would they go to Philip? Maybe because he was the only disciple to have a Greek name. You know, Philip means lover of horses. And Philip takes them to Andrew. And Andrew leads them to Christ. In the Gospel of John, Andrew is mentioned only three times. And all three times, he is leading someone to Christ. Not questioning, not teaching, just taking people to Christ. The first one is in John chapter 1. He brings his brother, Peter, to meet Christ. A few chapters later, he brings a boy to Christ who has the 
the loaves and the fish, to feed the 5,000. And now he brings these Greeks who are questioning to Christ. And one of the most satisfying experiences a person of God, a child of God, can ever go through is to lead someone to Christ. I'm not sure if you've ever had that opportunity to do. There's been an instance that always sits in my mind where I was working um, many years ago uh, at, at the Alfred and uh, there was a person who had terrible um, challenges with their heart and I remember just um, you know, sitting down with them and doing the medication. It was actually at night and, um, and uh, having an opportunity just to say, um, um, I'll pray for you, I said to him. And he said, don't bother. He said to me, I was a Christian once and um, that was a long time ago and I did some things in my life which I know that God doesn't want me again. And it was, um, you know, it was like an evening, it was about 11 o'clock at night during the night shift and I sat with him very briefly and I remember I spoke to him about David and what he did, terrible thing that he did with Bathsheba and Uriah and how Christ, how God still welcomed him back after repentance. And then... Um, I had a day off and the next day he came and saw me and he said to me, he said to me, you know what? Um, I think I had this heart attack, he said, so I can come and speak to someone again. And I felt so humbled, I felt so humbled that God would use me as a servant of his. And it's not for me to be glorified, it's because God chose, was able to use me and I made myself available. And it was such a... I still get teary thinking about it because it was such an amazing experience. And for those of you who haven't had that experience, I urge you, consider it. Reach out. Take someone, lead them to Christ. And the reason I get tears in my eyes is because a day later, the man had a massive heart attack and died. And God uses us in ways which we don't know. And I think it is such a shame for you as a believer, as a child of God, if you haven't had the opportunity to witness to someone, as Andrew did, to take them to Christ. I challenge you to consider doing that because you're missing out on such an amazing experience. And finally, as I was reading through this passage, I was struck as to how the previous chapter ends. If you read um, John uh, eleven fifty seven, it says, Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they may seize him. It's a melancholy end where the leaders of the Jewish faith dishonor our Lord Jesus Christ by proclaiming him publicly a traitor, to the law. And thankfully, chapter 12 comes around into play, where in the depths of this attempt at humiliation by the chief priests, honor and glory is heaped on Jesus. In verse 1 in chapter 12, Mary honors him by anointing him prophetically with perfume at the supper, this amazing, wonderful gift. Verses 12 to 19, the common people honour him as he triumphantly enters into Jerusalem. Verses 20 to 26, the Greeks honour him by inquiring after him with a longing desire to see him. In verses 27, we didn't read these bits, but verses 27 to 36, God the Father honours him by a voice from heaven bearing testimony of him. Verses 37 to 41, the scriptures Honour him as they are fulfilled through him, as we read in verse 41. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Verses 42 to 43. He had honour done to him by some of the chief priests whose conscious, whose conscious, conscious witnessing for him. And they lacked the courage to speak up. And we read 42. 
Then, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. They did not confess him. And finally, in verses 44 to 50, finally, Jesus claims honour to himself by asserting his divine mission here on earth. What a way to end such a terrible command that the priests and the Pharisees and they had given of dishonour. So as I conclude, firstly, focus on what is important. As I mentioned at the start, if you had one week to live and you knew about it, your, your perspective would suddenly change from the present and it would change to the eternal and why wait? Why wait until you have one week to live? Start today. Let's shift our perspective today. Secondly, have you ever lost yourself in worship in your own private time? How often do you go to that quiet place where you can spend that personal time with God? Not petitioning Him for things, asking God, can you help me with this? Can you give me this? Can you make this happen? No, but, but just in simple adoration and worship and thankfulness. Have we broken that alabaster box of our life and poured out ourselves, every drop of ourselves for him? I love what Woodrow Kroll, um, an American evangelist, writes. Do your actions fill your entire environment, your workplace, your home, your school, with the sweet fragrance of what Christ has done for you in your life? Do those around you stop and marvel at the delightful scent and aroma of your offering to the Lord? And thirdly, when is the last time that you led someone to Christ? When is the last time that you shared your faith with the lost? When is the last time that you allowed that delightful aroma of Jesus Christ in you to be smelt by those around you who are lost and have never smelt this beautiful perfume of Christ in you? And finally, do we honour our Lord with our lives or do we dishonor him with our behavior and our thoughts may god bless these few words in our hearts this evening and i'll close with a prayer before i invite the guys to lead us into the last hymn father it is before your throne of grace that we come this evening to thank you for this time that we've shared together. We thank you, Father, for your word. Father, we pray that you help us to live a life that points to you, Father. You help us, Lord, to be an aroma, a sweet, swelling, smelling aroma, Lord, to those around us who are lost. For them, Lord, to pick up and notice that there's something different with us, Give us the boldness, Lord, and the wisdom to share and testify to those around us what, what you have done for us in our lives, Lord. Let us not be afraid of what we're going to say or how we're going to be perceived, but let your Spirit, Father, guide our words. And let us just be used as a vessel for your glory, Lord. And Father, finally, let us bring glory and honour to you, Lord, in what we do and not dishonour pray father for the rest of this evening for the times that we will share tomorrow lord and as we said at the start for those who couldn't be with us this evening we pray that you give them a portion of their blessing as well in the name of jesus we pray amen